Uh, my name is Ima Jane Stalkin. I'm Protestant campus minister here at UMass Lowell, but with uh, Dr. Gamash, I was one of the co-founders and we are still co-directors of the Peace and Conflict Studies Institute, the sort of entity on campus that was in place. So when, well, you're gonna talk about the Greece Cause so I won't talk about that part. He's gonna talk about that part. Anyway, um, welcome very much. We are very pleased to have our new scholar with us today and we're very pleased to have all of you here today for our 21st annual Day Without Violence. And this is Dr. Rob Gamash. Thank you, Amijin. As Amijin alluded to, we've been doing the Greeley Scholar for Peace Studies since 2008. Uh, we've had a tremendous lineup of scholars, including uh, Nobel laureates, uh, Tang Prize winners. And this year, we're, we're delighted to have our 2016 scholar who, I won't say who it is yet, I'll let the provost do that. Each year, the Greeley Endowment for Peace Studies Advisory Committee selects a Greeley Scholar for Peace Studies. This year, they have selected Sanam Anderlini, international peace activist and women's rights advocate. Ms. Anderlini becomes part of a seven-year tradition here at the university, including six other peace scholars whom you saw in the video. Linda Beal, Padraig O'Malley, Gabrielle Solomon, Nobel Peace Prize winner, Lemai Bowie, John Prendergast, and Tang Prize winner, Justice Alby Sachs. She is co-founder and executive director of the International Civil Society Action Network. ICANN is the acronym. She is also an author specializing in gender, equality, and nonviolence. She has worked extensively with the United Nations, training governments and NGOs worldwide in peacemaking. In 2011, she was the first senior expert on gender and inclusion on the UN's mediation standby team. For nearly two decades, she has been a leading international advocate, researcher, trainer, and writer on conflict prevention and peace building. In 2000, she was among the civil society drafters of UN Security Council Resolution 1325 on women, peace, and security. Between 2002 and 2005, as director of the Women Waging Peace Policy Commission, Ms. Anderlini led groundbreaking field research on women's contributions to conflict prevention, security, and peacemaking in 12 countries. Since 2005, she has also provided strategic guidance and training to key UN agencies, the UN government, and NGOs worldwide, including leading a UNPA and UNDP needs assessment into Maoist containment sites in Nepal. Ms. Anderlini has published extensively on gender, peace, and security issues. She was the 2014 recipient of the United Nations Association of the National Capital Area Perdita Huston Award for Human Rights. As the UMass Lowell Greeley Scholar for Peace, Ms. Anderlini will be participating in several events targeted to students and faculty in the community to raise awareness and to explore ways to prevent escalation of violence by promoting rights, peace, and pluralism. I encourage you all to attend her events here at the university and in the community over the next three weeks. Thank you to the Dana McLean Greeley Endowment for Peace Studies, the Peace and Conflict Studies Program, and the Community Relations Office for making these events possible. Sanam Andalini, for the work you do to make the world a better place, for inspiring many of us to do more, and for peace building, I'd like to present a memento to you for your residency at UMass Lowell. Patty Coffey said there were white gloves to wear when you touched this, but I'm you got guys speaking. And it says to Sanam Nargini Anderlini, Dana McLean Greeley, Scholar for Peace Studies, University of Massachusetts Lowell, 2016.
We are honored to have you here, and we look forward to your remarks. Ms. Anderlein. So when I heard about the, the Dana Greeley um, scholarship, I looked up to see who he was and what this was all about. And I was really extremely touched because it's about universalism. And I was, uh, I grew up in Iran. I'm, I'm Iranian by birth. Um, and in the school that I went to in kindergarten, we were singing the national anthems of different countries. And in first grade, we, we did the Mexican hat dance for what was our annual school a celebration, which was International Day. And in art class, we were drawing the pictures of the Mayflower at, at you know, um, when, when it's time for the Mayflower and Thanksgiving and so forth, and, and, and learning about Chinese New Year and, and, and Persian New Year at the same time. And, and so I grew up with the notion of universalism really from, a, from early childhood. And that has really been the key to the work that I've done over the last 21 years, actually. Um, and I wanted to share with you, in a sense, what we've achieved and also what we haven't achieved. Because looking forward into the future right now and really standing where we are right now, um, as, as my generation and I think those, of, those who can't come before me, we have a lot to apologize for, for, what, for the kind of world we're leaving you with. And so I want to bring you into the conversation and, and see whether together we can actually take it into a better direction than, than what we're seeing at the moment. Um, one of the things that I've found over the years is that when people ask me or when I have to fill out forms to say what my profession is, I still don't know what it is. Um, I, you know, peace builder is not really a profession out there, right? So, so I don't know, I sometimes say I'm a human rights activist, sometimes I just say I'm director. But recently I've started, I've started calling, calling myself um, an elephant herder. And I'll tell you in a minute why I say that. Um, but before that, I just wanted to explain the trajectory of my work and specifically around women and how that actually also relates to the question of, of youth in the, in the context of peacemaking and peace building. I was interested in the idea of how you go from an authoritarian or a dictatorial system to a democratic system without going through war and violence. That was something that always struck me, mainly because as, a, as an 11 year old, I experienced the Iranian revolution we left for a 10-day vacation with a suitcase full of winter clothes, and I didn't go back home uh, for seven years after that. I didn't see my father for seven years. And throughout my life, this, this issue of when you have turmoil in your own country, um, it, it, it doesn't stop. It's not, it's not a one-off event. It comes back at you in different generations. Somebody gets sick, and you don't have a, they don't have a visa to come over and visit. Um, your children are born here, and at the age of three, they say, Mommy, why was I born in England, and everybody else was born in Iran? So every, throughout my life, this question has been there, that what happens in your own country when there's turmoil, and it's not resolved. So I started this work in the 1990s. I was in my 20s, and um, very quickly learned that we have a big structural problem in the world today. The international peace architecture that we have, which is basically the UN system, that was founded and grounded in the aftermath of World War II, um, is designed to stop interstate wars. It's, it's designed to stop world war akin to what we had in World War II and World War I. And in a sense, it's done a pretty good job over the last 70 years, more or less. The world has been largely at peace. We've had all sorts of proxy wars and so forth, but we've been used to the idea of living in peace. We take peace for granted. But since the end of the Cold War, since the 1990s, we've seen a different trend. We've seen the emergence of civil wars and then transnational wars. And in these contexts, what, what we're also seeing is that um, the actors of war are no longer just states. It's not one country one country's army fighting another country's army. It's a country, maybe a government, fighting its own people, like we see in Syria, bombing its own people. It's rebel groups, you know, militias and rebels and so forth that, that form, and they are non-state armed actors. And then what we've seen, of course, in the last few years is the transnational nature of this, that, that you have people fl flowing in from different parts of the world to go off to Syria or to Iraq or to, the, to Afghanistan. It started with Afghanistan back in the 1980s um, when the Soviets were there. So this, this, what I, what I, the way I call it is it's almost like we've had a democratization of violence and a proliferation of actors. All sorts of people can pick up arms and become violent. And, and that 
proliferation is getting worse and worse because it's becoming, it's almost like the message that, that extremist groups sent to us is that you can be your own agent. You can go off and do something. So we see the San Bernardinos and, and the Brussels and, and so forth. This, this is one aspect of, of what's going on and it's very, very dangerous. So on the other hand, we have an international system, as I said, that doesn't really know how to cope with that. They're used to states. They're, the, the UN system is designed to say, if two states come to fight with each other, we can intervene and deal with it. But if it's within a country, or it's with if these non-state actors, they really can't do very much. And that's why you see Syria being the mess it is, right? So what do we do in this context? Now, when I started this work in the 1990s, um, we were looking at the problem and realizing also that the wars that we see today are really fought on the backs of civilians. It, it used to be that, that in World War I, 90% of the people who were killed were soldiers. By the 1990s, 90% of the casualties of war are civilians. So kids, women, elderly, etc. And, and the whole battlefield, the concept of a battlefield has disappeared. The battlefield is people's homes, it's the villages, it's the communities. And in places where we've had civil wars, like Bosnia, if you're, if, if you've hit, for you it's probably history for many of you, but for many of us it was to happen yesterday. It's when you have ethnicity and religion coming into the midst of it, it's neighbors fighting each other. In Rwanda, during the genocide of 1994, literally neighbors were killing each other, and families who were m married as Hutu and Tutsi were killing each other's relatives. So the notion of peacemaking also changes. It can't just be a bunch of military guys and a bunch of political uh, leaders getting together in a room and, and, and you know, <laughs> saying, okay, we're gonna stop fighting and we're gonna divide up power. If, if the peace within your society has been shredded, if the social fabric has been shredded, then peace has to also be rewoven together from the ground up. And you need to look and see who are your, who, how do you do this? Who are the sectors in society that can do this? Um, and for me, the, 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 the issue that I came up with, or, or what I realized very soon in my work, was that actually, if we put on a lead, if we put on our glasses and we look down at ordinary people and recognize that the vast majority of ordinary people actually don't want to get involved in violence. Um, and within those ordinary people, who are we talking about? That, that, that who are the first people to pick up the pieces and keep looking after their communities and their families and caring. Um, what strikes you is that across the world, it becomes, it, it, the, the, it's women who stand up and do this. And I, I wanted to sort of share with you some of the stories that for me have always been my anchor and my, my touchstone when I, when I think about, you know, whether the work I'm doing still makes sense or, or not. Um, the first one is 1998. I was in a very hot conference room in London. We had, there was the first time that we brought 50 women from around the world war zones uh, that affected crisis zones and war, war zones. And there were women talking about their experiences. And one lady stood up, her name was Rose, and uh, she had the saddest eyes I'd ever seen. And she started talking about the need for peace and reconciliation in her country. Uh, and, and she was from Rwanda. And this was four years after a genocide where 800,000 people had been killed in three months. In three months, 800,000 people were killed with machetes. And it was a time when, at the UN, they were debating whether to call the genocide in Rwanda a genocide. Because by UN charter laws, if it were a genocide, then the international community would have to intervene. But if they didn't call it a genocide, they could sit back. And they were debating that word when 800,000 people were getting slaughtered. And this lady was in the midst of that. And four years later, she was standing in a, at a podium in London talking about the need for peace and reconciliation. And she talked, and, and as, she, as she spoke, I later found out that she had lost 100 relatives. And she had been picking up body parts of her own relatives. And yet, four years on, she had the courage to come and talk about peace and the need for forgiveness and the need to move on. And so, that, that was the first moment for me when I realized I want to work with women because to this day when I think about that and I think about anybody touching any of my relatives and what would I do in that context, I don't know. I don't know whether I would have that courage. But over the years, I've come across women who have found that in their heart and their soul and they're committed to, to moving things forward. I later met a South African woman. Um, her name is Tandi Modise. She was... Uh, a guerrilla fighter. She had been known as the um, knitting needle bomber. 
in South Africa, and had been part of the ANC and the anti-apartheid movement, had spent time in jail, but had come out and was in the Defense uh, Select Committee. She was in the Parliament of South Africa. And when the defense industry folks had come along and said, we need to update our military budgets and our military and our, and our defense industry um, you know, equipment and so forth, and we need helicopters and, and uh, submarines and, and things. Um, basically, the same guys, you know, wanting people with vested interests, wanting the government money to sp be spent on, on the defense and security industry. Uh, she had turned around and she said, well, wait a second, what are the security threats that we face? Let's go ask the public. And so they started a national review process of going into towns and villages and asking ordinary people, what do you think the, your security concerns are? Now imagine if we did that in this country today, a nationwide consultation in towns and cities and universities everywhere saying, what are, the, what are your security concerns? What do you think we would be saying compared to where our military security budget is actually being spent? And in South Africa, they did this, and they came out with a range of things. Some people said, we need street lights, because when you don't have street lights, you get mugged and you get raped on the streets. And some people said, the water in our rivers are contaminated, and the land is polluted because we've had military bases here and there. Some people raised the question of HIV AIDS and poverty as security threats. They were talking about human security, right? And, and what Tandy and her colleagues, both in government and, and outside, did was that information became the basis for them reshaping the national security priorities for South Africa at the time. So that's another source of inspiration. And I, and I have to tell you, she told me the story herself. And a few years later, I went to South Africa to, to document this research. And I was really worried because I thought, well, maybe she exaggerated that this is what happened. We did interviews across the different sectors. And every single person I talked to reaffirmed that this is what had been done in South Africa. And yet, it's not a story that is often talked about in terms of what it means to rethink the national security priorities and paradigm of a country. The next story that, that keeps me going often is the story of my colleague um, who's Sri Lankan. Uh, her name is Visaka. Her son was in the army in Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka had a 30-year war between the government and the uh, Tamil Tigers who represented the ta Tamil minority in the north and northeast of the country. Um, uh, who had been discriminated against and had, and had started a rebellion and it became a 30-year war, essentially. And Visaka's son was in the army and he went missing. And what she did was she led a group of mothers of missing servicemen into the jungle without any weapons, without any arms, to talk to the rebels who, in principle, had either killed her son or disappeared him or she, she, never, she never really knew what happened to him and, and the government never had an answer for her either. But when she spoke about this work that she did, and she talked about meeting these young men who were, the, who were the rebel leaders. She talked about finding and searching for the humanity in them, understanding that they were young men and maybe they were fathers too and they had children at home and, that they, and, and taking food for them and, and really showing compassion and often talked about how in the end they were like her children too. And this, this has always struck me because over the years in my work, as I've gone to different countries and I've worked in different places, so often the language becomes technocratic and, and bureaucratic and political. And we lose sight of the human face and the emotions that are there. And so one of the tactics that I've started using is that when I come across, it doesn't matter, I've had conversations with Taliban leaders, I've had conversations with Maoist fighters in Nepal, with Jamaican gang members in, in, in the streets of Kingston, and one of the first questions I ask them is, what is it that you want for your sons and your daughters in five years' time? And it's amazing. It's amazing how that conversation opens up. Because even the Jamaican gang leader turned around to me and he said, I want my children to be well-educated, I want them to speak properly, and I want them to have good table manners. And I bet a lot of your moms and dads would probably say the same thing. So it's really that connection that at the end of the day, we may, we may think that we don't have anything in common, but when you start thinking about it from a very personal human perspective, it's, we can find the space for a conversation. It's not that we agree with each other, it's not that we agree with the use of violence and so forth, but it's, it's that dialogue and, and, and finding that humanity. And then more recently, in 2011, I met some Syrians. The Syrian war had just started. Um, the rhetoric in the, in the media here, in, in our political spaces, was very 
Adam and Assad must go, and, and we must get rid of this, and we must, and it was selling weapons and arms and, and, and trying to arm rebels. And I came across uh, some Syrian activists, and they have been working with a network of ordinary people, young people across the country, teaching them how you talk to each other across political differences. So instead of, so when you live in a dictatorship, you don't often have that chance. You don't speak, right, because you're afraid. You don't know who you're talking to, and, and you're, you're not meant to show dissent. But to actually provide safe spaces for, for people to show that they have different political views or their, their different fears, and that actually when you enable the space for dialogue, you can find commonality, is something that, that my colleagues were doing. And they came to Washington, and, and we, we hosted a meeting for them with some, with some US government officials. <coughs> and they turned around to, to um, the State Department officials, and they said, why are you all helping us kill each other instead of helping us talk to each other? Right? And just think about it. The amount, again, the amount of money and resources and time and energy we put into arming people and fighting and so forth compared to what we put into diplomatic processes. As an Iranian, I've seen this over the years vis-a-vis -vis the U.S.-Iran relationship. And, and before the Iran deal was signed, I used to say that even in a, in a friendly divorce, there's more conversation between the two parties than we've had over the last 30 years between Iran and the U.S literally just in terms of the number of hours that we sit and talk to each other. And what we found is that when there's political will, of course they can find the way. But you have to have that political will. And, and, that, and that's one of the things that, it's not that we can't solve these problems, it's whether we have the will. And so we come to 2012. Um, I, through ICANN, we, we bring together women from across the Middle East, North Africa, and Asia for them to learn from each other the work of peacemaking on the ground. And I was, we were sitting in a room, and um, for the first time in my career, as I listened to people speaking from one country after another, Tunisia, Libya, Egypt, etc., something very dark um, and daunting occurred to me. Everybody was talking about the rise of extremists, the emergence of extremist groups and militias coming into their country. So the Tunisians, Tunisian women were saying, we're seeing these Salafis coming in. These are, these are extremist kind of militias that, that claim to be Islamic, but actually it's just, it's, it, it's a veneer of religion. It's really not religious. Um, and, and they are promoting female genital mutilation and they're forcing us to cover. And then the, the Libyans said, they're coming into our country and first they're going after the dead because they destroy the shrines. And then they're going after the vulnerable, which is the women. And the same day, the American ambassador was attacked and the, and the compound was attacked in Benghazi, which, which we hear about all the time in Congress. Um, and the American ambassador was killed. And the media picked up the story of the American ambassador. They didn't pick up the other stories. And, and for me, what was striking at that moment was A, that each one of these people from 12 different countries was saying the same things. They were seeing the same trends. And it, it struck me that what we are beginning to see was 2012, and, and, and unfortunately that it's exacerbated and accelerated since then. It's really almost like the beginning of a new form of world war. But it's not armies and Hitler and stuff. It's this chaos that we're seeing. So fast forward to 2016. Just a month ago, I was at a meeting. And um, there, was a, there was an expert talking about countries affected by extremism. And he totted it up. And it was 120 countries this year that are, that are affected in one way or another. Right? That's a lot of countries. Right? So we, this is the new threat that we live with. We don't know where it's going to be. And the extremists. The ones we hear about are ISIS or Boko Haram in Nigeria or maybe Al-Shabaab in, in Somalia. But when you think about it here, when you think about the, rhetoric, the political rhetoric here that, that is fomenting um, ethno-nationalism and, and the Islamophobia and, and the fact that there are so many guns around and so forth, it's, these are all forms of extremism that, that we're beginning to see in our own societies. And, and the danger is that they're pulling at some very real issues. And, and so, so this is what I really wanted to, um, to talk to you about. And this is when I say I'm an elephant herder. Because, because what, I, what happens in Washington is that people don't really want to talk about the seriousness and the complexity and the depth of the problems we're facing. Um, and, and so very often when I'm in, in meeting rooms and in conferences, I'm the one who says, excuse me, can I just mention the elephant in the room? And then there are a series of elephants. So these days, I'm the elephant herder. And, and I don't know whether I get invited more or less anyway. Um, but, but here are the elephants I wanted to, to talk, talk to you about. So number one, 
we are living at a time in history, in the history of humanity, where on the one hand, we're seeing the most pluralistic societies ever, um, pluralistic in terms of the identities that we are all allowed to and, and to have and to celebrate. You know, whether it's whether it's your gender identity, your racial, religious, sexual, it doesn't matter. It's it's this pluralism which is so beautiful and so diverse, and it's everywhere, right? On the other hand, when you have these multiple identities, there's a challenge of how you bring about social cohesion. What is it that binds us together when there's so many differences and what and that different identities are pulling at, at us? And what we're seeing is that groups that um, have sort of agendas of their own are using our identities to try and separate us, right? So one group says, we're Islamists, and the other one says, we're, you know, we're the whites, and we're this. And, and so, so we're being pulled in different directions. And, and because we, so I, for me, as, a, as, a, as an Iranian and growing up as a Muslim, I never really thought of myself in terms of my religious identity. But when I hear somebody being, you know, saying derogatory things about Muslim populations, I all of a sudden say, well, that's me, right? So now all of a sudden I'm, I'm bearing, wearing my Islamic hat. Or if somebody talks about Iran in a derogatory way, well, I'm like, that's me, right? So instead of feeling as if we belong together, it's, we're being pulled apart. So that, that's one thing that's going on, and, and, it's, and it's a very dangerous space. And it's, it's the extremes that are pulling. The moderate, vast majority, moderate middle is still, is, is still living their lives, but we're not raising our voices and, and calling it out in the way that we should. That's one thing. The second thing that, that's happening is that it's, we, we're, we've gotten used to the idea of living in what I call actually extreme capitalism. The inequalities that we're seeing, the gross, gross in income inequalities and wealth, wealth disparity that, that we all understand and we live with, and it's part of the political discourse right now. But what that has also done around the world is that for the last 30 years, we've had policies where we've said, you know, governments shouldn't pay for education, governments shouldn't pay for health care, governments, governments should be receding from social services and social welfare systems, right? Now, you leave a vacuum, somebody fills that. And I saw this in my own, with my own eyes. In Jamaica, a gang leader was paying for the school books and school pencils of kids in his community. As those kids grow up, who are they going to be loyal to? They're going to be loyal to him, right? What are his interests? Some of it may be very good, but a lot of it may also not be very good, right? In, in Latin America, we've seen the Catholic Church pick up this issue. They're providing for services for the poor. But with the services for the poor comes an ideology uh, around reproductive health rights of women. And so you're seeing that space being squeezed specifically for women. In the Middle East and North Africa, which is, which is again, the areas that, that, that we've been working, we've seen the, the same kinds of issues arising with Islamist groups. They provide services. Hezbollah in Lebanon provides all sorts of services for people. Right? But there's also a, an ideology that, that goes with it. Right? And women are really at the forefront of feeling these ideologies, because it doesn't matter whether they have a veneer of religion or an ethno-nationalistic um, ideology, they have an issue with where women should be in society. And, and I say that, that we're, we're seeing a trend of three things. Either they want to co-opt women to make them be the sort of messengers of, of their ideology, um, or they're coercing them. So we're seeing, for example, the Boko Haram and, and, and the, the ISIS, you know, rape, you know, kidnapping and raping and using women and girls. Or if you happen to be a women's rights activist or a peace activist or a human rights activist and you're standing up and challenging them, they want to kill you. So, in our, so with our partners in Libya, for example, we've had endless cases and endless, across the region actually, endless situations of women who have stood up for basic rights and, and uh, uh, human rights and peace and social justice and they're getting death threats and they've had to leave their countries. Right? So, this is, so women are, are like the early warners. They're the canary in the mine of, of what's been going on. But you bring it out to the international sphere, and what's been shocking for us is that women have been warning about these things for so long, and the international community tends to say, oh, but violence against women or these types of repression, that's the local culture. And yet, when it spills over and it metastasizes, then we say it's terrorism, right? So, the, the importance of listening to and hearing what women are saying is absolutely critical because they're the first ones to feel it and hear it, and yet we still ignore them. And, and the other side recognizes the power of women and is trying to co-opt them and, and give them agency, but within their own uh, midst. So, so th these, are, these are some of the issues that, 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 we're, saying, that we're seeing. The other um, element in all of this is that we're, we're also um, not willing to acknowledge that 
we have governments that are fomenting and enabling a lot of the bad stuff that's going on. So on the one hand, there's a question of what is the US's own role in the world, how it, you know, since the Iraq war, um, right now, Saudi Arabia is bombing Yemen with our support, by the way, with all of our tax dollars, uh, which is one of the most frustrating things I think that we should, we should all know about. But what is it that we do as governments that, that creates this problem? And then who are we friends with? And where, do we, where are we silent? And, and this is the next, this is, this is a big issue because in Washington, if we talk about Saudi Arabia, people say, yes, 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 we know. We know that the Saudis have this ideology and that they've been spreading it and they've been seeding it for the last 30 years everywhere, including in this country. But, you know, we have a deal, Saudi is our friend. And so we're not allowed to talk about it. And yet it's right in front of us. So, so that, as I say, these are, these are, these are the moments when, when I think about myself in terms of um, having to be honest about the challenges that we face, that, that we're faced with, and, and the reality of, of, uh, of, of the problems that, that, and the complexity of the problems that we have. Um, now, bringing it back to you and, and you as young people, I should say, um, and, and you know, what, what responsibility we have for you. What worries me is that we have these types of problems, and then when we look at the institutions and we look at the approaches that we're taking, we're not really doing a good job of giving you strong structures to move forward with. If I work a lot with the UN, and over the last few years, you really feel as if the UN system has been stretched. Um, and a lot of the rhetoric that we hear is not really put in practice. So for example, they'll talk about the importance of preventing conflict. Makes sense, right? We should stop wars before they take place. Right? But then you look at the budgets, and you think, how much money goes into the UN's Department of Political Affairs, which is the place where they do mediation and they, they try and do conflict prevention, versus what goes into the Department of Peacekeeping Operations, which is the guys that come in after there's crisis and then we have to go in and clean up the mess. De the Department of Political Affairs gets $40 million. The Department of De uh, Peacekeeping Operations gets $7 billion. Right, so our money is not going where our mouth is. Right, so that's one thing. Now, the flip side of this is also happening. Um, we have a global agenda that's been established called the Countering Violent Extremism Agenda. We want to you know, collectively all fight against extremism, as I said, without necessarily dealing with the fact that we are part of the problem and we're, we're a source ourselves. But we're looking at the question of extremism. And within that, there's a lot of talk about working with cities and working with local communities and working with women and, and, and so forth. What we find in our work is that civil society, independent, uh, whether it's media, whether it's university spaces, whether it's human rights organizations, civil society is really a critical pillar in the space for promoting moderation and pluralism and diversity and against extremism, right? Um, it's number one, it's, it, it's, for example, if you're interested in, in the environment, you, it's a place where people come together across race and religion and, and we get to be together as, uh, around issues that we care about. But it's also the important place where we can voice dissent and be constructively engaged with our state. So in a university space, you want to be able to have a critical conversation around what's good and what's bad and, and let's think about you know, what kind of activities we can have and so forth. In the media, you want the media to have a robust engagement with the government around good and bad stuff. But what's happening with the, with the um, CVE agenda, as they call it, is that governments around the world are using the, the excuse of countering violent extremism to actually shut down this, this moderate, middle, independent space. So as I stand here today talking to you, in Egypt, we have partners who run human rights organizations, and they're being hauled in for interrogations. In Turkey, uh, university professors are in solitary confinement because they dare to sign a peace petition. Just imagine that. They dare to sign a peace petition. They're now being labeled as traitors, and they could face seven years in jail for simply doing that. Okay, and, and so, and these are our friendly countries. So what, and where are we in terms of our policies? Well, we're still giving Egypt military aid. We're still, you know, engaging Turkey in terms of military issues. They're part of NATO. So not only we don't put our, our money where our mouth is in terms of conflict prevention, we don't put our mouth where our money is when it comes to addressing these really critical issues. We're handing out the money, but, but we're not really engaging constructively about the importance of these spaces. So that, that's another big, um, big challenge. And then at the 
crux of this problem is that we've forgotten to articulate what it is that we are for. So very often you'll hear about people talking about ISIS and it's all the nasty negative stuff that we hear about, right? They're, you know, they're chopping off heads and, and all the horrible things that they do, which is absolutely the case. But they don't recruit on the basis of that. They're not going around sending you know, recruitment videos and, and online and social media saying, hey, come along and, 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 and get involved in suicide bombings. And, and what they're doing is they're saying, you, know, you have a problem. You, you, know, you, you don't feel that you belong in your community or, or you feel discrimination or you, or you feel that you haven't been heard. Come to me. We will listen to you. Here is a society that we're going to create that's going to be just and, and, and utopian. Right? They're, they're selling a positive message. Um, it might be, it, and it probably, you know, as we know, it's totally false, but that's that they're going out and recruiting on that basis. And yet what we're doing as a, as a global community in terms of the policy context is we're just saying we want to counter extremism. We're, you know, we're, we're against extremism. We want to prevent extremism. But when you ask people, what are we for? What's our positive message to send out? Everybody gets a little bit um, you know, uncomfortable and they start sort of wringing their hands and, and not really knowing what to say. Because one of the things that's happened is all the core values that, that we stand for, or we should be standing for, democracy, human rights, et cetera, dignity, human dignity, um, you can, you know, the minute I say, do we stand for human rights, somebody will turn around and say, excuse me, what about you know, in terms of Israel-Palestine, or what about in terms of Yemen, or what about in terms of Egypt? The double standards of our own foreign policies are coming back to haunt us in, in, a, in a very, very serious way, not, not to mention the drone attacks and, and others. So we, we have been playing this game for a very long time, but it's really reaching a point where it's getting so, the situation is getting so, so much worse that we have to stop and really revisit and rethink what is it that we want to be standing for moving forward. And you as young people in this space, because this is the world that, that you are entering into, how do you want to engage in it? How do you want to shape it? And so, so I want to end with just a few um, thoughts on that. Einstein said that imagination is more important than knowledge. Now, it's kind of interesting for scientists to say that. Um, but, but it makes sense because you need, to know, you need to know what's going on. But you don't want to get stuck in that. You don't want to just get stuck in, oh my god, things are so bad and there's, you know, there's nothing we can do because that's nonsense. In, in fact, to me, pessimism is, is a luxury of, of, uh, of the elite and, and of people who live comfortable lives. You know, somebody growing up in Chad in, in the middle of a camp doesn't have the luxury of thinking, oh, I can't do anything, because they have to get up in the morning and find fuel and, and, and feed their kids. So, so the issue of what do we do, problem solving, is, is really important. And you need, you need imagination to, to, think, um, to think beyond the, the, the present. We need a new peace architecture. If we think about the 20th century as, as the peace architecture of relations between governments, and that more or less that's worked, and we've, we've actually lost count of how effective that is, because it's not just the diplomatic sphere, it's air traffic control, and maritime issues, and, and all sorts of health issues, and so forth, that the countries are working together uh, around. But the problems that we face, as I said, is, is the internal problems. And, and what we need to do is bring that peace architecture into our own society. So one idea that I had uh, working in Kenya a couple of years ago, um, was that imagine if we had social service for young people. And social, instead of military service, it was, it was basically you came, out of college, you came out of high school and for 18 months you got to choose between doing environmental work or health work or education work or emergency work. And units were formed so that it was really bringing together um, young men and women from across ethnic, social, religious, geographic divisions so that as you did this work, you actually got to know the diversity and the pluralism of your own society. And, and, and it was a way of knowing each other on a human level so that later on when you went back to your lives and politicians came along and wanted to divide you, which is exactly what happens in most of the countries we're in, including right now here, we could actually stop and say, hang on a second, you know, you're trying to tell me that that, that tribe or, or those people are, are, are you know, violent or nasty. I know them. They're my friends. Right? So, so bringing that universalism um, back at, into, into our own societies. It's just an idea, and, I, and I'd, be, I'd be interested in getting you to think about what else, what, what you think would be a way of helping us bring about the cohesion with, with the pluralism that, that, that we have. The next thing is, is, is kind of in a way more abstract, but one of the ways that we look at the world is we always point to the negative. Right? So we look at these issues and, and we'll, we'll hone in on 
the 3,000 or the 5,000 um, second generation Muslim immigrants in Europe that have gone on to, to you know, gone to fight a night in, in Syria. And for me, the question always is, there's 3,000 there or you know, 500 girls that, that did that. What about the millions of others who didn't? Why is it that we always focus on the negative? Right? And, I, and, I, and when, especially when we look at the developing countries or countries that are in crisis, we always look at all the bad stuff. Right? And, and my, my example is, imagine if somebody came to, to Lowell and they did a conflict analysis. And the conflict analysis is looking at all the problems, the poverty and the crime and whatever else is going on. It could give a pretty bleak picture of, of this community that, that you live in. Because if it's not balanced with the positive, it, you know, it's all the bad stuff. But we need to look at the positive because in the midst of, even in the midst of war, even in the midst of the most horrendous things that are going on in the world, peace prevails. People, it, it's almost like, as Khalil Gibran says, life's longing for itself. It's, you give a ball to a couple of kids in the streets of Aleppo or in a refugee camp, they're playing. People want to have, people are still getting married, people are still having babies, people are still laughing. In fact, in fact humor becomes a, a real um, way of dealing with, with crisis. So the, the normality and, and peacefulness is integral to the way we want to live, and yet we never look at it. We never look for that. We never look for the people who are maintaining peace in, in, in those societies. And, and coming back to my work with women, that's what women are doing. Very often that's what they're doing for their kids. And, and then you take, from, from women, you take the lens and you widen it to young people, and then you realize young, a lot of young people are doing the same thing. Today in Yemen and Syria, so much of the services, water and education and things that, are, that, that people need on a daily basis, is women and young people that, that have mobilized to provide it. And yet, those voices are missing from the peace table. Those voices are missing from the places where the negotiations for the future of these countries are being negotiated. Because we, what we do is we say, the guys with the guns get to come. If you're a spoiler, we will invite you to a peace talk. But if you're a peace actor, good luck to you trying to get to a peace table. And my work over the years, 20 years we've been trying to do this, more or less, you know, we're making some progress. But it's very, very frustrating to see that this paradigm doesn't shift. And even when we try to shift it, there's a tendency not to listen. You know, I don't understand well, how we can give an award to a woman who's been fighting extremism in, in France or in Iraq, but when we bring her to Washington, we're not actually recognizing her expertise and thinking maybe she can give some advice to, to our you know, technocrats that are sitting in, in bureaucracies and, and suggest to them how to do, do things better. So that's another part of our work. We're trying to bring the voices of women into these spaces, and, and we call it uncomfortable truths because you know, a, a, a UN official or a, a Washington government official doesn't necessarily want to be told that eh, what you did was, you know, some of it was okay, but a lot of it created even more harm. But actually that's what they need to hear, if the intention is good, if the intention is to actually try and bring about peace or improve things on a country. But the issue of listening and valuing the positive, um, that, that's there. Another aspect of this is that a lot of our language and the way we operate is around the notion of power. So we'll say, you know, again, we'll talk about peace talks or, you know, in, in Afghanistan and Syria, and it's really about bringing the guys together and doing a power sharing deal. I was with the UN in Somalia in 2012. There was a famine going on and we had a peace conference and they brought various political military leaders together. And it was all about power sharing and these guys wanted, somebody wanted to be president of this, this republic, this, this province and this, this state. They were sort of doing a, um, trying to sort of create a federation. And at one point I looked at my, colleague, my UN colleagues and I said, you know, we should start talking to them about responsibility sharing. Because if you want to be the president of Galmaduk state or the president of whatever other state there is, um, you better have an idea of how you're going to get water and food to your people. Because leadership isn't just about power for me, it's about responsibility towards others. And if we at the international level don't start speaking this language, we're just perpetuating the problem that it's, it's about individual gains as opposed to uh, collective responsibility. Um, and then two last uh, thoughts. One is the notion of freedom of expression. We think of freedom of expression as a right. But I think more and more we have to think of it as a responsibility. Where you have the, where you have the, the space and the freedom to speak and to address issues and to talk to your politicians and to raise questions in the media, it's time for us to do it. Because if you don't, somebody else will. And if you don't, somebody else will do it on your behalf and shape your future for you. So if you're watching TV and you don't like, 
you know, ask the questions. Who are they talking to? Do they have a good representation of spokespeople? Call your congressmen and senators around the issues that you care about. Because if you don't, I can guarantee it someone else's. The lobby groups are there. Every time there's a shooting in this country, the NRA is active on the Hill doing what they can because the rest of us carry on our lives. We get worried about it, but, but we're, you know, we, we, don't, we don't engage. And when, when we don't speak, someone else is filling that space. So think of freedom of expression as, as, a, as a responsibility and own it and become an elephant herder and, and get out there saying what you need to say. And finally, I come back to the whole notion of, of the universalism in, in this, which is that at the end of the day, we have, we have to get back to the notion of the shared humanity that we have amongst ourselves. Instead of thinking us and them, it's us together. Because this world that we're living in, and, and, and certainly with climate change is a big problem, it, as things get bad, it's going to be affecting all of us. One way or another, it's coming, it's, and, and we're feeling it already. So it's important to see the humanity in the other and, and, and think about it in terms of dialogue as opposed to falling into the discourse of fear and, and warmongering that, that has become so commonplace. And I wanted to end with a quote from a, a, a good friend of mine um, who spent many years in Israel as a peace activist running a, a women's organization. And she spoke to the UN Security Council in 2002. And towards the end of her speech, this is one of the things that, that, that she said to them. She said, women's char characteristic life experiences gives us the potential for two things, a very special kind of intelligence, which is social intelligence, and a very special kind of courage, which is social courage. We have developed the courage to cross the lines of difference drawn between us, which are also the lines drawn inside our heads, and the intelligence to do it safely without a gun or a bomb, and to do it productively. Even when we are women whose very existence and narrative contradicts each other, we will talk, we will not shoot. And you need us because we, will, we women are willing to sit together on the same side of the table and together look at our complex joint history, and she's talking about Palestinian women that she works with, with a commitment and intention of not getting up until in respect and recipro reciprocity, we can get up together and begin a new history and fulfill our joint destiny. Thank you very much. <laughs>